Okay, so uh, welcome back. I'm talking to Alison Wiggins. Uh, she is an educator, a lecturer and a teacher at, in secondary school and a, an activist. Um, so yeah, we were talking a little bit before the break, um, obviously about BAME, the acronym, but we touched on, you know, we talked about being in straight, straight um, jackets and the reverse situation um, for, you know, uh, white counterparts entering into um, a black space and um, but but we also talked about not being able to show certain emotions or certainly I brought it up um, around anger and disappointment and not being able to um, express yourself because they may not have the emotional literacy or because of the stereotyping and the shorthand associated with being black and also being an other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the angry black woman stereotype is something you cannot underestimate yeah. the pervasiveness of. Oh gosh, of. yeah. It is um, like defining for some people. And we are all aware of that. And if you look at schools, there's an amazing book called Blacklisted. Everybody needs to read mm. it by um, Jeffrey Boachi. And he talks about like rude girls and faciness mm -hmm. and angry black women mm. and all of these things that are pervasive in schools. Mm. Girls are, black girls are not angry or upset. They are aggressive. Mm. They are violent. They are rude. They are feisty. And it's the, the way that you, the language that you use to describe young people helps to shape what they understand yeah. themselves to be. Yeah. And I was labeled as like that when mm -hmm. I was at mm -hmm. school and I see people doing it continuously. An amazing school that my friend worked is in has banned the word aggressive. Yeah. Teachers are not allowed to use the word aggressive to describe students. And it has fundamentally shifted the way that people um, record um, incidents, the way that they communicate with each other about students and the way that reports are written. Um, I saw a tweet the other day by a black woman who got her first report from her year seven child's mm -hmm. um, secondary school. Every single teacher had used the word aggressive. Every and it's such a subjective term, actually. It, but also, it's not aggressive. Like, it's not aggressive, but it's such a manipulative term to use because it's so subjective. Correct. And it's so kind of inviting someone else to empathize with you isn't it exactly. when you say someone was aggressive you're inviting empathy yeah. and and you're manipulating a but certain the point situation is you can't see aggression yeah you can see anger you can see violence you can see disruption you can see all of those things you can't see aggression because aggression is supposed to be the root of what it is that the child yeah. is doing but the point is language is powerful yeah. right and stereotypes are pervasive stereotypes of black women mean that you and i even when we don't even realize it are consistently making people feel comfortable around us by making ourselves smaller by me making my laugh louder um, and by being a little bit less by mm -hmm. bringing a little bit of less of myself mm -hmm. by being more guarded mm -hmm. and that actually is exhausting mm -hmm. if you are doing that for eight ten hours mm -hmm. every single day to every single person that you meet it has an effect on your self-esteem mm -hmm. and your psyche mm -hmm. because you start to think hold on is it them that's the problem or is yeah, it yeah, actually yeah, me yeah, yeah. and for a long time I I, I think internalized the, the the phrase and the term and the label of angry and I convinced myself that I had anger issues I didn't at all but I believed what I was being told mm. and I was lucky that I had like a counter narrative that I could use but lots and lots of people don't have that so you know the stereotypes part of the issue with the BAME is as soon as you label somebody in that category there are a whole number of stereotypes that come with it shorthands yeah, there's shorthands yeah. and this is th those things are so powerful and the more you feed those stereotypes the more pervasive they become and wh what we have to do is we have to dismantle them we can't just keep using the same language and expecting people people to change their mindset that comes with that language we have to change the language yeah you know it absolutely spoken has to happen. written 100 percent, the whole thing but you also have to reject the labels that people try to put on you and that is a really difficult thing and i said to someone the other day 
um, my head teacher at my school, we have just got a black female head teacher, mm-hmm. one of what a hundred in the whole country. Mm. Um, and in a meeting, somebody said she's scary. And I was just about to, this is what I do all the time. I interrupt, excuse me, you can't say that to me. Mm. I do it all the time. Mm. I have to, I've got no choice. And mm-hmm. again, it's exhausting, but it's necessary. Mm. But my white male mm-hmm. colleague, Had you, did he, he didn't even, I, I didn't even have the chance to speak because he was like, you can't say that about yeah. that. Do you know what saying, um, like using the word scary to describe a black woman in an educational yeah. institution actually does? Yeah. You can't say that. No. You need to find another way to describe her. Yeah. And Good the man was like, I'm really sorry. I didn't even realize that I was doing that. Mm -hmm. What I meant was, is that she is stern and she really... So you have got the language then. She does have the... Exactly. (laughs) But for once, it wasn't me. Yeah. And I think that's progress, right? Yeah, exactly. If if that can happen in that space where I was the only other um, Mm. non-white person, Mm. but a white ally actually spoke up for me. And that to me is is like life changing. Mm. It's happened to me since when um, I was talking. We were talking about the stereotype that black people can't swim. Again, just my other half loves swimming actually, <laughs> and he's very bloody good. I mean, most of us like my family's from the Caribbean. We live on an island. Yeah. Of course, we can swim. Yeah. Anyway, um, and I was trying to explain this as as a, a stereotype. And again, my white friend who had read the book The Clapback. Again, mm-hmm. please read that book. It's mm-hmm. amazing. The Clapback is. Um, a, a, analyzing uh, 10 racial stereotypes right um you know that we we run fast mm. that we could we can't swim our, te- well. our PE teacher told me that we had heavy bones yeah someone told and me I was that kind at of school like, is this science no it's not science i've never heard about this it's before it's absolutely Rubbish. untrue but that is what i was told as well yeah, and that's why we weren't good swimmers yeah nonsense mm. again this this idea that there's a biology that comes with race yeah. there isn't that's complete complete pseudoscience Anyway, so, but she, she was like, no, Alison, I know this because she'd read the book and she actually spoke up for me. And I was like, rah, I just kept quiet. And the man was really humbled. He was like, do you know what? You're right. Would he have taken it the same way coming from me? Probably not. not. But do you know what? That's progress. Mm. I'm 41 years old and that has never happened to me. The only white person who has ever advocated and spoke up for me Mm. when I was being basically discriminated Mm -hmm. against is my mother. Yeah. So for these people who are just my friends, they're un- I know now that they are allies, mm-hmm. for them to have the confidence to be mm-hmm. able to do that, to me shows progress. Mm-hmm. We are basically a year away s- since George Floyd's mm-hmm. murder. Mm-hmm. And lots of people want to say that nothing has changed and everything mm-hmm. is just going to be mm-hmm. as awful as it always is. I don't believe that. In order for us to make progress, we have to have hope. And um, again, I don't know if you've seen this. Have you read um, the Underground Railroad or seen the Amazon show? I've seen the, some of the Amazon show. Um, I've, and I've seen it advertised and just watched the trailer. I haven't yeah. watched it. Um, you have to mentally and psychologically and emotionally the, and prepare the reason, yourself. One of the reasons why... Um, um, so last year, and it would have had a, an effect on a lot of people, but actually what happened last year had a really big mental impact on mm-hmm. me. So one of the reasons kind of I've just tried to not distance myself from the issue at all, but kind of be careful about what I consume. 100%. Is because it's kind of a little bit about preserving Your my sanity. My sanity. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what happened last year, it was the momentum and the, the intensity. Um, it really kind of, a lot of it, I, uh, much of it I kind of knew obviously, but the kind of collective Mm -hmm. um, and the sharing and the visibility of debate, uh, I say visibility because I watched it, um, watched lots of videos and obviously read read some key bits of literature, the kind of key ones that were being pushed at the time, like Akala, Edo Lodge. um, But one of the reasons why I haven't watched um, the, uh, the Harriet Tubman um, Am- it's it's Amazon, isn't it? Or yeah, is it but there's two. There's a film ah, there's, about think, Harriet yeah, Tubman yeah. specifically, but this is the Underground Railroad, oh, which is a scri- which is a, a series about an amazing book by Colson oh. Whitehead. The book is phenomenal. Like I have unfortunately read a lot about slavery because mm. I need to understand my history. I mm. need to understand my heritage. Um, I'm of Caribbean origin, but I know that my DNA comes from Nigeria, so mm. that didn't happen by accident. Mm-hmm. But When I was watching that yesterday, I literally had to stop. I have to turn it off and I have to move away from it because it is traumatizing, it is distressing, it is upsetting. And I I couldn't even sleep last night, but that doesn't mean I wasn't wasn't, um, 
glad great, that I'd yeah, watched it. But the point of it is, is what I really like, and this is what I tried to talk about yesterday, is that my ancestor survived that. In order for me to be here today, my ancestors survived the most brutal dehumanization that has ever happened to any human beings on this planet. My genes survived because my ancestors survived that. And when you see, you hear people say, I am my ancestors' wildest dreams. Yeah. It really struck home to me yesterday. Do you believe in yesterday. generational trauma? I do believe in generational trauma, but I also believe that we have the capacity to build hope and to change. Mm. But seeing that really reminds me of how far, to some degree, we have come. Obviously, we are not there yet. No. I'm under no illusions. Are, are we close enough to not to say, for instance, that um, we are in a... Because one of the things we talked about, I know we're going to talk about data shortly, but would you say we're in a post... No. No, no. Because no. this gets banded around, you know. That colour blindness yeah. and post-racial... Like, no, no I really don't... You absolutely. know, multi-post uh, racial diversity is sometimes linked to, to this thing. Yeah, no, we are not there yet. Absolutely. And um, one, and But we'll talk about the data, because I know we want to talk about the data mm. and um, that you know about this issue um, specifically as well as others. But um, yeah, so so they're collecting the data, employment and institutions, when you apply for charity funding, third sector, and you know, in, in, in a, you know, the commercial world as well. But, but what are they doing with it? That's, that's exactly the point. Data for data's sake changes nothing. Mm -hmm. um, the point, I don't actually mind. My problem is not with how they, the fact that they are collecting yeah. the data, it's whether or not the data is doing something to change yeah, the narrative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's where the issue is. Um, I don't need another report to tell me that institution, institutional racism exists in schools and in education. I don't need another report. There has been enough yeah. written about and this. And recommendations, There's yeah. the, the recommendations are there, and they're just getting diluted and watered down and repurposed all of the time. The issue is not with the data or the way the data is collected. The issue is with what happens to that data and the action that comes from understanding that there is a disparity here. And we all we want is... We just want equity. We want equity, we want respect, and we want recognition. However that comes about, I'm not fussed. But we can't just keep identifying a problem and then, then not finding a solution to yeah. deal with it. Yeah. Don't come to me with more problems. Yeah. Come to me with a solution. Do something about it. Take some action. And uh, you know, I'm not saying that the movement and, and everything that happened as a result of what happened at last year it, you know, is going to fundamentally change the world. But as you said, there is a heightened awareness and understanding. And to Lots some of degree, people making movement yeah. within their companies, um, you know, uh, taking on roles, taking on roles that they may not have felt they could, but they've been, you know, uh, putting themselves forward mm. and being more vocal. And I, and you know, and going through that space and journey because I think. You know, like you say, it's working and navigating and moving towards something. But, you know, speaking out at mm. work and being counted and applying and sitting on boards and committees and applying for that, that job at a different grade and beginning to kind of know that actually uh, you may not have felt that you had a place there, but you definitely should, um, you know, you should be heard and go for those those places and just and and be represented on that scale so like higher middle management that kind of thing because some people just wouldn't apply because they thought you know I never get it mm. but certainly within my own friendship groups there are people that are kind of making movements sitting on um, racial e um, equality boards at work and committees and uh, driving forwards because obviously lots of companies release their statements. <laughs> some were slower than others. Uh, some were more articulate than others. Some had measurable outcomes. Others had general kind of mm. rhetoric. Uh, but certainly amongst people that I know personally, uh, they are more, they are speaking out a lot more, whereas before they would have held their tongue because they would have, uh, they would have expected it to affect, you know, that I, I think people are just, not playing it down anymore. They are ready to speak out and that's a positive thing. And what I have been inspired by is that once someone speaks out, then another person speaks out and then another person and some there's some consensus building and like you say, and it's hope like you're 
colleagues, uh, you know, stood up and said, actually, I'm not going to let you do it. I'm going to do it now. And, you know, and that is, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, um, it, it's a good thing. It is. That is allyship and that's solidarity. Mm -hmm. And the only way we're going to move forward is if we all agree that this is the right way mm. to move forward. And I completely agree with you. And I'm not saying that it's perfect, but I'm saying that this is how change happens. Mm -hmm. And I went to Paul Gilroy's inaugural lecture yes, at UCL the other day. Him, yeah. um, and he said that his um, journey to, you know, to education, to writing, to his profession professorship started because of the Brixton riots of 1981. Mm. He said if that like societal change hadn't happened, if people hadn't woken up to it's the a fact- jolt. Yeah, It's been it a is jolt. a jolt. And that's exactly what happened in 1981, and it's happened several times since. And that's how change happens. And he said he, wouldn't, he would not be in UCL as a professor if that hadn't have happened. So to, to kind of minimize the impact of, of, of the movement last year and, and what that has done to people, like you said, in terms of their own self-esteem, in terms of the recognition of the issue, and in terms of, to some degree, some institutions, you know, even if they're doing it not necessarily for to look like they are like woke, whatever, mm -hmm. um, they're doing it. And I've seen a shift. People are asking me for training. Mm -hmm. People are listening to what I have to say mm -hmm. rather than rolling their eyes when I, when I start to talk about race again. Like I am the person who has no choice but to constantly say, that is not okay. Mm. You cannot say that. And now I'm not by myself in a lot of spaces. Mm. I've been given the opportunity at UCL to give anti-racism training to every single PGCE student who's about to go into the That's, profession. Do you know what? Because I come from a teaching background as well. I haven't said that on camera, but that is an invaluable um, piece of work. Because certainly when I was, we were told, oh, th there's these trends amongst these students, Caribbean boys are underperforming, blah, 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 differentiate, be inclusive. But no one gave us any kind of anti-racist um, education. With me, you know, there were some things that were just built in. <laughs> uh, but with others, you know, I, I would see, I would see and hear and, you know, hear, hear anti-black comments, uh, you know, and other comments directed at other groups and um, from different diasporas and racial backgrounds and it, and it was that and also it, there was this idea that we had to conform to Englishness and Britishness and you know we had to be grateful me and my sister who you know you, we used to do this little sketch where we used to go thank you Queen for letting us in your country but it's true because that's how we were made to feel that, that we had is. to be grateful we had to be humble we had to play it down yeah that's the model minority right so that is the idea that in order for us to be accepted we have to be humble and grateful yeah. and we can't keep up kick up a fuss or say anything about that um again a really really damaging narrative um and again i think damaging in, in ways that you know particular minority groups have been um, given that label as mo model minority and that others us again as not fitting the model minority. Um, I think, yeah, it's just really important that everybody understands that change is not going to come by waiting um, and it is going to come to some degree incrementally, but it starts with us. We cannot just sit here and moan and identify all of the problems and not do anything about it. So th whatever you choose to replace BAME with, um, I was reading today in pre kind of preparation for this, that in um, America, when they do the census, there are, let me get this right, I think 20, more than 20 ethnic categories yeah, that I, you can yeah. choose. Um, whereas obviously it's not the same here, but when I was growing up, Sandra, it was black, white or other. Black, white, yeah. Asian, or yeah. other. I had to tick other. And I had to tick other. And then I wrote Creole. And then I remember my boyfriend at the time was say, so you're going to replace mixed other with mixed. And I was like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm going to do. And that is powerful. Like, yeah. the f that has changed in my lifetime. Yeah. People like me had to tick the box of other. Do you know how it feels? Yeah. You're not even consider. You're not even no. in the box. There is no box for no. you. And even now, the boxes are not great, but they're progress. Yeah. It's progressive. Yeah. Something is happening. Something is changing. They're acknowledging that there are more people who identify as mixed. There are more people who identify as not just Black, African, or Caribbean, but Black British. That is a category which was only introduced in the last few years. Yeah. And the fact that th that is happening to some degree, I think is progress. It's mm -hmm. not enough, but l let's take the wins when we can get them because otherwise 
what's the point? If you allow yourself to get bogged down with all of the problems and how terrible everything yeah. is, you will do nothing. Yeah. You will become static and you will become it's really like paralysis. Miserable. It, it is like paralysis yeah. because you'll feel like completely disempowered. And I'm not ever going to be disempowered mm -hmm. again. I am empowered now. Mm -hmm. I will speak up. I have the confidence. I also have the knowledge mm -hmm. to challenge things. And yes, it is exhausting. And yes, it is emotional labor. But for me, it means that the next generation of young people that I am working with are not going to have to go through the same things that we have. So I don't care what you choose to replace BAME with. You have to acknowledge that we are here, that, that we get treated differently, and that there are things that institutionally, in terms of policy and practice, need to be done to address the disparities which are inevitably and consistently being identified. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. And you know I was going to ask you about a couple of things, but I think what you've said has pretty much summarised some of the stuff I was going to refer to. Um, you know, this kind of melancholia, colonialism, you know, let's make it great again, let's bring our independence back, let's be English and British again. It's like we are the babies of colonialism, multiculturalism and, and multi, um, you know, this whole array of hybridity and mixing and and different races and cultures has enriched and in fact provided unity and all we are asking for is unity and equality that's what we are asking for that's exactly so, it and i think that you know I, I was reading about like possible alternatives so minority like just by saying something is a minority you are diminishing you're it. an afterthought you're an afterthought you are a deficit you are you're not even in the same category um, person of color. Yeah, see, I don't know. Like that one, I agree, it's not ideal. But I sometimes, like, I don't know even how to describe myself to recognize the shared and the cons the, uh, the consensus I have with um, other black people and other mixed people. So I have used that about myself, mm. which is not ideal. And even but when I say it, I slightly do a little cringe, <laughs> but I think, what else am I gonna say? Yeah, and this is the point. Are you gonna identify yourself as an ethnic minority? No. no. I think I, I see nothing wrong with person of color other than that. Are there people who have no color? Exactly. The, it's an absolute no. Like, yeah. you know, w these labels are not descriptive. Yeah. They're used to identify people yeah. with. They're not used to actually describe them because yeah. no person is white or black. Yeah. No person exactly. is, a, a, you know, an ethnic minority. So person of color, I think, is, is goes some way. But yeah. all the connotations in this country that come with being colored yeah. in terms of the racist And that we've moved away yeah. from, yeah. And it feels, you're right, it feels like a little bit of a regression. Yeah, to go yeah. back. So person of color, um, ethnic minority, racialized minority, um, I was also thinking about, you know, majority, like global majority. Yeah. I when I see that. See, written, I like that. Yeah. I really like that. I think global majority is just accurate, right? Yeah. It's just accurate. There are more of us than there are of any other yeah. group uh, across the world. In this country, obviously not so mm -hmm. much. But global majority is a way of identifying, and to some degree getting people to think about the power yeah. imbalance that exists. And it's a more of a move towards um, collectivity and humanity and, and stripping back some of these labels, mm. isn't it? But what we've also not really touched on is, is people identifying themselves as white. White people don't see themselves as white people. Mm. They are just people. people. They're neutrals. They're just people. Yeah. They're the ones and everybody else is other. Mm. Maybe what we need to do is start encouraging white people to claim their race yeah. because it is a race. Yeah. You are part of the racial hierarchy. Yeah. You are part of the ideology of the race. Whiteness that, and you yeah. being called a white person does not diminish you. No. So if it doesn't diminish you, then you need to accept that with that whiteness comes power and privilege. So, you know, when people are referred to as white people, they, some people get quite offended by that. And they're like, well, why are you bringing that up? And I'm like, well, because you brought it up. Yeah, I, I'm, I am not racist. Yeah. If I, def if I say you're white, <laughs> I am not being racist. No. Yeah, and, and that's the thing, that people really get defensive. It's like, they can I, uh, I am not allowed to get defensive about you referring to me, saying, what are you, constantly to me. 
And where and are you really from? Yeah, where are you really from? Yeah, but you're not English, are you? Oh, well, I'm British. Okay, I'm allowed to say British today or not? Yeah. You know, it's that kind of thing. And you're absolutely right. And in the, I'm gonna um, just reference um, something I read recently by the Higher Education Research Action Group. It was published mm -hmm. this year. Um, and it was called Beyond BAME, and it's is kind of discussing ah, this issue. And I'll definitely yeah. send it to you because I think it's an amazing article. Yeah. And maybe we can put a link to this yeah, um, absolutely. somewhere. Yeah. But what they were talking about there is why are we not calling white people the white majority ethnic group? Yeah. Because they're so, so used to being categorized as just people, to put a prefix to mm. that, mm. they feel diminishes them. Yeah. It separates them. Yeah. So if they can empathize with what it feels like to be put apart categorized. and categorized and yeah. separate from other yeah. people, then to some degree they will start to understand what it feels like to be called an acronym uh, in a way that's used as a noun. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like the conversation needs to shift and it will and it is. Um, and if they are gonna replace BAME with something else, then they need to make sure that that, that comes from the people who are identifying themselves so that we can clearly articulate what the problems are that exist within particular groups. Like you said, racism and anti-blackness to some degree are, are never really separated. Mm. Um, so trying to identify that there are very specific groups of people who suffer completely disproportionately in terms of outcomes and life chances, if you can identify that, then hopefully you can address that particular group and give them what they need rather than assuming that everything, we, we all need the same thing. And that's the yeah. difference between it's equality that one size and equity. Yeah, it's all, yeah. Exactly. And we want racial equity. I'm not going to be apologetic or I'm not um, embarrassed because of my heritage. I'm really proud of it. I don't want to be included. I, be to I don't want to be tolerated. Yeah, exactly. I want to belong. I want to not always be the other. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is a move, a step in that direction. Yeah. By not assuming that we're all the same and therefore we need exactly mm -hmm. the same mm -hmm. kind of interventions yeah, or measures yeah, or considerations, yeah. what you're doing is creating that level of like nuance that you said, yeah. the, the complexity that comes with that. And therefore you give every group or even every individual yeah. what they need yeah. rather than just assuming, yeah. you know, what we'll do is we'll just employ some more black people. That's not going to no. help. Yeah, no. You're import or the best person for the role and ignore the other things external that 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 affect how you're seeing someone from the outside. Exactly. So even removing race, removing gender, removing sexuality from application forms massively improves the level of diversity mm. in an organization. Mm -hmm. There's an amazing study again in that clapback book mm -hmm. where they talked about um, uh, uh, people in an orchestra mm. and they started having blind or um, mm. blind auditions mm -hmm. where they just listened to the music yeah. they didn't look at the person yeah. and that increased their gender um, disparity that they had mm. that increased it to almost 50-50 yeah. just because they couldn't see the yeah. person playing and that tells you everything about the stereotypes that come just from someone's name sometimes yeah, even so you know marking work and yeah. teacher assessments like you know there are expectations about someone. You know, and we unfortunately, know that that's so often, and I, we will end, I know we've spoken, Sorry. but honestly, I want to get, oh, 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 we need to talk about some of the other things that we've kind of gone off on, especially the communications and the media and the anti-blackness and stuff like that. But one of the things which is devastating in education, which you will know about, is how much expectations based on the external affect on paper and yes you might read something or the teacher might read something and be surprised but when they're marking because they've got a, a level of expectation of the student you know they may, may be harsher and I think um, there have there have been a lot of studies about that that have, that have shown even with you know names that don't sound you know yeah that's exactly right so in our school to address that because we acknowledge that that, that is a problem all of the scripts from all of the mm. assessments that we've been doing have the candidate numbers on mm. them, not Nothing the student's else, name. Yeah. Because you do have an expectation, you know who your A grade and B grade students are, mm. and then you mark to that. Yeah. That is a normal way yeah. of your brain creating yeah, schemas yeah. which allow you yeah. to understand the yeah. world. But that disproportionately affects different groups of young people. Mm. There are kids who um, are labelled as EAL, as disadvantaged. Gifted, used to be gifted, gifted and, talented. and talented. I don't know whether they still do that in they schools. They do do it. Um, right. They're called like highly able. They're all oh, of these okay. kind of... So uh, it's still a label. It's just been it, yeah. <laughs> tweaked. Again, language. It's evolution. Yeah. It's the same, it's the same yeah. concept. But the point is, is that when 
teachers have these, um, they have this data, they see the student, they just apply the, the, the label directly to the student and then assume, well, because that kid's EAL, I'm going to treat them like all the other EAL yeah, yeah, kids yeah. I've ever had. Yeah. No understanding of their culture, ethnicity, no understanding of what language they speak at home, of their proficiency, whether or not they can write, or nothing. Yeah. How it's to push them, how yeah. what their interests are. Yeah. Yeah. And it's all of that. It's, it's, I get what you were saying earlier is just this idea that we white people get to be individuals yeah. and we are representative of our entire yeah, race yeah, we exactly. don't get to be individuals yeah. we are the black woman yeah. therefore all black women are like us so mm. if we let them down mm -hmm. or we do something wrong or we're angry then what we're doing is feeding the stereotype that that that, that wh white person yeah. then has about people who look like yeah. us so and we if don't, we don't meet the stereotype yeah i don't think of you as black wow. and that's another conversation Thank you so much, Alison. Definitely welcome. need to keep talking about issues related to this and other issues, of course. But it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. I feel like I've learned so much. I've got a reading list and a film list. Um, very grateful. Thank you again. Okay. Hello, everyone. This is um, our first ever podcast, um, and it's Planet Diaspora. Our topic today has been to BAME or not to BAME or as I put earlier to BAME or not to BAME uh, please comment underneath um, are we ready to change what does BAME represent for you and what your thoughts are um, again I'd like to uh, thank our expert guest um, Alison Wiggins and uh, thank you for listening